But I said, I'm proud of Tulsa. It has come a long, long way. And I know we think the effects of the riot is responsible for it. I said, but all of these years have passed. And we've come a long, long way. We still got some little things under the table that we can't exactly get rid of. After having lived in Tulsa a long time, we had a movement. Everybody quite ought to have some colored friends. That was in the churches, I think. Well, then we visited churches. Congregations in that pastor would go to a white church. Well, really, the churches aren't white. I got in trouble one time downtown coming out of the convention center. Somebody came and got me and said, come here, Miss Hill, a man's looking for a color, for a black church. I said, he doesn't want me because I don't know where it is. Well, we just got through telling them if anybody knew, you knew where all the black churches were. <laughs> I never will forget that experience. Okay, I couldn't go back in the building, so I had to keep walking. And I walked up to the gentleman and asked him if he was looking for a church. He said he was. I said, you know the name of it? And he went in his inside pocket and pulled out a letter, and he said yes. And the name of it is Vernon African Methodist Church. I said, my goodness, that's my church, and no wonder you can't find it, because it's not black, it's, it's red brick. So the Tribune was there, and I got on the front page of the Tribune for having made that statement. But this is the way I look at it. We have no black churches and no white churches. We have churches where God's people worship. I love that they're trying to rebuild an assassin, like that they're trying to rebuild Greenwood, and I love all of the energy that's being put behind that. But I feel like the families have just been lost in the whole process. Those people who suffer at the loss of their damages and their families, you can say, well, they're not here, but that historical trauma has carried on for generations and generations. It is still in the minds and the hearts of those people, and they just have never I think we need Tulsa needs to embrace them. I think they need some kind of assurance. I'm for financial reparations, any way that that would work. I'm for helping them in the community, helping those families. And also, I think that I would like for us to take a stand against hate, whether it's political, whether it's economical or if it's social, and it doesn't matter whether it's on the local, state, or national level because it will certainly impact uh, the success of Tulsa flourishing to be the city that I believe it can be. What do you feel is the most important thing Tulsans can do to help with the healing process after the massacre? Nothing will ever be communication. That is the one thing that we should always find reason to communicate not just about a particular point in time, but looking at time on a continuum that involves all of us. The one thing that, that has become very clear to me in the last few years, that black history was intentionally not taught to African-Americans for the most part, the totality of our history, and it was intentionally not taught to white Americans as well. So you had two people on the same planet sharing space together, but having really no sense of who we are because we sort of start around 1619 at Port Comfort and we kind of go forward from there. But I think it's important to have an understand just as I clearly understand Queen Elizabeth and Sir Walter Riley. I think it's important for people to understand the Africans of the 25th dynasty of black Africans that ruled all of upper and lower Egypt. For many people, because they don't know this, they would think this is just something you're thinking about. But when you clearly understand that we all come from a place that has history, we all do. And we all have a story, an incredible story. But if that story is never told and we do not understand that story, then we begin to start where we want to start. And sometimes that's not the best place to start. You came to Tulsa in 1927. That's my husband in college from this university. Mm -hmm. uh, now, he was not always in journalism. 
tell me about what made him decide to found the Oklahoma Eagle newspaper and what made him decide to become a lawyer? Well, he, he came here, he, a, 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 he had a busy, he amazing business because his father was a pioneer in Tulsa and there were businesses here, but um, <clears throat> there was something came out in the Tribune. That was not to the detriment of the Lord, he was concerned, and he just said, well, I got my own trash paper. So there was a Mr. Blockman who had a paper in, behind his, his post office. It was a, just a flat bread press about the big red nine on the table. But uh, eventually we got that for $2,000. I still haven't checked it and paid it all. Then, of course, we went to a larger building and gradually uh, developed. He didn't know anybody journalism, but he gradually developed an interest in me, brought people into the office. And 57 years now, we haven't missed a week. 57 years. Although, the main time looks like he won't because he takes money, it's got out of bed. Mm -hmm. Well, that is a wonderful story that I, that I did not know about the, the Eagle. So it was really well, the protest, the protest against the unfair coverage. See, when I came here, everybody said to talk about in the Greenwood area, Greenwood, Greenwood. So one day we just sang that, things to say North Tulsa, because we heard about North Little Rock, and so we thought of North Tulsa. Just thought it got, and when, we, when I came, it was the most sharply segregated city in America. You just didn't go across Archer. I've heard that, that uh, even in the Deep South, there was more geographic uh, communication between the races than, than Tulsa. Yeah, well, you know, I, because I came back to the West after the race, I was in 20, I was seven years, but they were just rebuilding at that time. But uh, it was an interesting place to live. And was, uh, I started teaching at uh, $88 a month, glad to get it. $88. And we had to go out of the city. We couldn't, we had to take to study in the summer. And we, there was no place to go except the Langston Arts. We all would go to the University of Colorado. We paid our own expenses. Mm -hmm. that, that is one thing that uh, some people say today that education is just on a silver platter for young people today. It's just all around, just a virtual feast. And they do not take advantage of it. That, right. Does that bother you? It bothers me to the extent that they're, they're just shortchanging themselves because. Now, I know growing up, my mother was very, very strict about our, what we did. We couldn't cut paper dolls even back. We couldn't cut paper dolls on Sunday. We couldn't do anything with any fun. We didn't miss from Sunday. Oh, you couldn't? We, no, no, no. We went to church all day, really. Mm -hmm. But we did a lot of reading. Mm -hmm. We couldn't dance, but there was no. And that's my, we never go in the car. But we did have a 12 foot uh, that uh, Harvard Classic. My father bought that in 1912. Oh, okay. So I grew up with, we have some of those books still. The title, Black Wall Street 100, obviously the centennial recognition, it's 100 years later. But I'd like for you to elaborate a little bit on that subtitle about an American city grapples with its historical racial trauma. What is the historical trauma in Tulsa and for whom? So Black Wall Street 100, as you correctly point out, is a reference to the, to the centennial commemoration. What's going to be on the minds and hearts of people who visit us and even people who are already here as we approach the 100th anniversary of the massacre is what's different about Tulsa today? What's different in that expanse between 1921 and 2021? We have been grappling with a historical racial trauma, hence the subtitle. We are not the only community in America that has historical racial trauma. In fact, Many, if not most communities in America have similar traumatic events in their past around race. So we can be a model or an example for how a community comes to grips with its past by first acknowledging and then apologizing, which apology for me is not just the literal act of apology, but it's also developing a sense of compassion and empathy for what other people have been through. And then the third prong of that process is atonement. How do we make amends for uh, the damage that was done? How do we repair the damage that's been done? So the title is really deliberate. Uh, the, the message is really deliberate uh, and direct around historical racial trauma. It's not historical diversity trauma. There you go. <laughs> it's historical yeah. racial, racial trauma. It's very particularistic around the African American experience.
I'm Glory Wells, and I manage Wanda J's Next Generation Restaurant located in Tulsa, Oklahoma, in the historic Greenwood District. Um, the Next Generation comes from my siblings. My grandmother opened the first Wanda J's in the Tulsa community in 1974, and she's maintained a presence in the community since then. So back in 2016, my sisters and I were given the opportunity to somewhat run our own location. We do get a ton of help from our parents still, but the primary focus was it was open for us. And um, we're just trying to keep her name alive and her legacy. Back in the early 90s, though, my grandmother did have a location on Black Wall Street. She had a Wanda J's, I believe Wanda J's 2. And um, my dad did manage that restaurant for her back during that time. So this is our second time being on Black Wall Street. So having a business in the Greenwood uh, area is definitely an honor in a sense. There's a ton of people that love to be down here. We get a ton of customers that come in and they try to figure out how they can get a spot down here some kind of way. But what sticks out to me the most is the entrepreneurial spirit that was here back when, like before the massacre. So I think that the business owners that are here now and business owners to come should definitely possess that entrepreneurial spirit. And I think that my grandmother had that spirit back in the early seventies when she opened. So I feel as if our restaurant being here is just a perfect match. We were raised to like possess the entrepreneurial spirit, like not to necessarily work for someone else, but to, you know, at some point have something that you're in charge of, whatever it is that you're interested in. And so I think having that entrepreneurial spirit makes it really cool being down here since that's something that my family has had throughout the years. And all of those individuals that had businesses here before us, they were like risk takers. They believed in themselves. They stood for what they believed in. And I think those are really good qualities to have being a business owner. So I think it's all pretty, it's pretty unique and it works together. Hi, my name is Vanita Cooper. Uh, people call me Coop. I'm the owner of Silhouette Sneakers and Art uh, in Greenwood at the corner of Greenwood and Archer. We're a limited edition uh, sneaker boutique, streetwear boutique, and art gallery. Um, and I think above all, a community space. Um, you know, we, we try to respond to uh, what we think are important issues for the community. Uh, for example, we've had, you know, voter registration drive uh, for the most recent presidential election. Um, we've, you know, helped raise money uh, for families facing evictions. Um, and, you know, we put on events. And so, you know, in terms of uh, the art scene, uh, the music scene, uh, whenever artists and musicians are looking for a space, uh, we try to provide that. Um, we've got a, a custom, uh, a custom stage, a blue stage that we built uh, for uh, local performers. And um, we, before the pandemic, we're doing events monthly and hopefully we'll, we'll get back to that soon. It's been incredibly rewarding to be down on Greenwood. Um, I went to high school in Oklahoma in Lawton and, you know, was required to take Oklahoma history to graduate and never learned about Greenwood or Black Wall Street until I moved to Tulsa a few years ago. Um, and, you know, obviously it's a very special community uh, with a very important history. Um, and so, you know, it was absolutely the place that I wanted to be. Um, and I had the opportunity to, to start my business there. I think uh, it's the most rewarding thing for me is just being able to extend the legacy of Black Wall Street's success um, or to at least take on that challenge of doing so. Um, I'm, you know, f find a lot of purpose in that, um, in trying to fill the shoes of, of the, the business owners who came before me. Um, it's, it's awesome because, you know, now that the history is being shared more widely, a lot of people come down, um, to Black Wall Street to learn about the area. Um, and it, it feels awesome to be a part of, of sharing that, that story. I'm actually always trying to educate myself um, so that I'm better positioned to tell an accurate uh, history of the area. Um, and, you know, in terms of challenges, I think, you know, we're, you know, we're still dealing with the fallout of the massacre and urban renewal policies and, you know, all the, the, the barriers that were put up uh, to prevent black businesses from succeeding. Um, you know, there, it's an underdeveloped economic area. Um, I think, you know, there's more development happening now. Um, but as a result, foot traffic is not awesome, uh, for retail businesses. Um, 
we are currently, it feels a little, we feel a little disconnected from downtown, even though we are, you know, at the edge of downtown. Um, and I also think, you know, because there's such a strong narrative around um, the race of the area, um, there are sometimes people who have expressed, not to me, but to others, that they're not sure if they can shop there because they're not Black, um, which is really interesting because now there's actually a variety of uh, different people who own businesses down there. But, you know, I just I just think as a city, we have a lot to learn about race relations still, and we have a lot of harms to repair. I heard about the Tulsa race massacre when I moved to Tulsa a few years ago. Um, I came here, I was an educator for 10 years and came here for an opportunity to work in a school uh, as a school admin. Um, I had set my sights on uh, being a, a school leader somewhere in Tulsa and ultimately kind of hit a wall with it, you know, working in public education. I Sometimes I hear about people who, I've been to retirement ceremonies for people who, um, you know, worked 30 plus years in public education in Oklahoma and, you know, they are real heroes. Um, I couldn't make it that long. Um, and so, uh, you know, along that kind of professional journey for me here, um, I explored the city, learned the city and learned uh, about Black Wall Street, Greenwood, the history of entrepreneurial success here, and also the devastation um, of the area um, and efforts to rebuild it. And when the time came for me to pivot in terms of career, um, it just felt like the right place for me to be. I'm Willie Sales. I'm presently employed at T's Barbershop, 120 North Greenwood. Our telephone for the barbershop is 918-584-1189. You can call for appointments. We'd be glad to work for you. We care for your hair. Stop by and see us. We've been at the present location since 1985, but I started working on Greenwood in 1963 at Mims Barbershop in the 1000 block, I believe it was, of North Greenwood. Then we moved across the street to 1143B North Greenwood, which was Tecumseh's barbershop. It was owned by Wilbert Tecumseh. He's a longtime uh, resident of the city of Tulsa. And he was more or less my mentor. And in 1985, after eminent domain, took our building in the 1100 block. We moved to 120 North Greenwood where we're presently working. And we called Tecumseh's Barbershop, then T's Barbershop. That's how we got T-E-E -E apostrophe S, 120 North Greenwood. And we're open, we cut hair, we shave haircuts, we shave beards, we just do whatever people ask us, do we also do eyebrows? Ladies get their eyebrows uh, all arched up and men get shaves and we hope they'll get a facial, but a lot of men don't worry about facial massage. The challenges were in getting started and getting the business to move along so I could be profitable. I uh, had a wife and four children Back in the 1900s, my uh, first children graduated from high school in the 80s. So the challenge was that cutting hair didn't afford me enough finances to raise those children. So those were the challenges. And I uh, worked for another company called McDonald Aircraft Company. So I, uh, after putting in almost 30 years there, my children got grown and we got them through school as far as they would go. And uh, they were able to be gainfully employed. Then I could lighten up a little. So in the late nineties, I uh, took early retirement. And uh, my challenge has been keeping the barbershop going, even though I work part-time. All those years, I always, since I went to barber school back in the sixties, then barbering was my profession. And I never did put it down for anything else. I cut hair part time for all those years while I worked the other job. Then when that job 
was finished, McDonnell Douglas decided to close its doors and leave with my uh, retirement that I anticipated. Then I had to work through retirement. So I'm still working. But the good thing, those were the challenges, the good things. The blessing is that I kept working. I kept uh, barbering. And once McDonnell Douglas shut down, then I could go full-time barbering. It's been a blessing. Mr. Tecumseh was my mentor. He did good. and He got ill and passed away in the early 2000s. So I uh, ran the shop a while for his family. Then they sold me the shop. Uh, and I've been there ever since, and it's doing good. We have barbers that work there with me. Matter of fact, I trained a couple of barbers. One of my uh, greatest assets to uh, the community, I think, was staying open so that families can be gainfully employed. That's what the Lord leave us here for, to help each other, each one reach one. That's what I usually tell them in the barbershop. If each one reach one, will teach one the right way then he can do the right thing and that's very important to me when i graduated from high school in 1962 my mother said willie you're going to go to tulsa it's a lot of people in tulsa said i want you to know that they had a bout called a race riot in 62 which was a massacre she said, when you go to Tulsa, you got to be careful. She said, Willie, don't smoke marijuana. And for God's sake, don't let nobody put a needle in your arm. Now, how did my mother know that in 62? She read the Tulsa World every day. So I guess, she, I don't know how she, she learned it. And I'm thankful she did. That was good advice that I pass on to my children and pass it to other people's children. That's how I learned about the race massacre through my mother. So my name is Angela Busby. I opened my Frio store on July 1st, 2017. Well, it's really exciting to have a business on Greenwood. First of all, I was born and raised in Tulsa and uh, lived uh, a, a first probably eight, nine years on Greenwood because my grandfather owned a, what was called a room and house uh, back in the fifties uh, where, you know, he would rent out rooms long-term or short-term and we lived in the back of the room and house. So being on Greenwood and living on Greenwood, it was just a part of my everyday life. So when I discovered Frio's and decided to open up a store here in Tulsa, that was the first place I thought about opening on Greenwood because not only did I grow up uh, here and on Greenwood, but I had other family members that had businesses when it was Black Wall Street during the 50s and 60s. So I felt like I wanted to kind of continue that legacy of uh, owning a business uh, on Greenwood. In terms of challenges, um, the biggest challenge I think that I, I, I faced initially was that I was um, I love this product. It's a great product. It's a healthy alternative to a lot of the um, other uh, snacks and desserts that are out there in that all of our popsicles are made with real food ingredients. And, and uh, so we have flavors available for vegan and gluten-free and dairy-free options as well. So I was impressed by that and decided that, you know, after a few months of research that I wanted to do it. However, I had no entrepreneur <laughs> knowledge uh, because I've, I've lived and worked in the corporate community, you know, all of my, my adult life. So the challenge has been learning how to be an entrepreneur and run a business and also still having a, a full-time uh, job. Uh, so, and then of course, the other challenge was the fact that um, there's not been a lot of foot traffic on Greenwood. Uh, so until you know more recently, obviously as the race, uh, the anniversary of the race massacre be, has become more widely known, and people are you know a lot of times coming into the Greenwood area uh, to kind of see what Black Wall Street looked like. Uh, so the foot traffic has kind of increased, but it's been a challenge in terms of staying in business without uh, a lot of that foot traffic. So obviously I've had to go outside of the store to 
attend events and festivals and and you know private deliveries and all of that uh, in order to to keep and maintain my business up to this point. Well, the interesting thing about it, you know, when I read that question, I thought to myself, when did I hear about it? And I, I suspect it was through the years, you know, somebody said something about it. I remember my stepdad talking about uh, having to hide under a bed. Uh, he was seven years old, you know, when it happened or, uh, but I didn't really fully understand uh, at that point in time what he was talking about in terms of nobody, nobody that I can remember ever said anything about the race riot. Um, so I grew up really not knowing what, what it was or what that meant. And of course, when I graduated from high school and went to college, married, you know, all of that, I was gone for uh, 30 years. And I, I returned to Tulsa back in 2004 uh, to care, take care of my mom after my, my dad passed away. But it was really wasn't until after that, after 2004, that I started to learn and understand what really had happened uh, in Tulsa and the race massacre and and the you know the burning of the buildings and all of that just in within these last you know 16 years. My name is Walter Armstrong. I am a, in the bail bond industry. And I've been on Greenwood for 16, almost 17 years. Well, there's very few challenges, mostly rewards, because there's so many people coming through, especially now. And what they're coming through and they're asking questions. And I'm thankful I can be here because I was raised here. I was raised on, you know, I wasn't raised on Greenwood, but this was like my playground. We sold eagles and, you know, and shine shoes and things all up and down when it was in its heyday in the you know you're in the 60s and 70s and it's just good to be back here because this is uh this is an area where i saw grow and then i saw it crumble and then it parts of it came back again so that was the good part of it. that's all the good about it so there's no bad it's all good i grew up in, in tulsa and I worked for, uh, at the age of 12, I started working for Bill Nafee's Grocery on Madison. And there was a tree next door. And these old guys would sit under the tree and drink. And I would come out when we were slow and I'd sit and listen to them. And they would talk about the riot. You, you know, some of them show their wounds. And uh, it was just, this was back in the, I'd say about 1960, 59 and 60, when they were telling me all of this. So a lot of those guys are gone. All of them are gone, really. But uh, they talked about it and, they, they, and about that, uh, can't think of the guy's name that was involved in it, how him, him, him and they thought he had a relationship with the lady and they were arguing and she didn't want the uh, relationship known. So she had to do that to cover it up because back then they probably would have killed her and him. So uh, they covered that up. And then when they arrested him, she went, they say she went and told them that it wasn't, but that he didn't do anything, but they wouldn't stop it. And it just escalated from their own. I am Latoya Rose. I'm the owner operator of Rose Tax Solutions and also the executive producer of the Black Wall Street Exchange. It's one of our signature programs. Uh, annual demonstration um, to show our community and to help our community circulate their dollars and know-how with minority merchants. And so we host that each year. And I have operated here on Greenwood Avenue since September of 2017. The importance of being here on Greenwood Avenue for me and knowing the history of prosperity and abundance that Greenwood Avenue once um, thrived in heavily um, it's very important for me to operate my business here, not only due to my family upbringing of ensuring that, you know, I have a thriving business, but also just realizing that we once were booming in North Tulsa related to just Blacks sticking together in their community. So for me, learning that history and really being able to embrace that history even the massacre 
but realizing the resilience that my community had, even with rebuilding the district and the, the sense of community for me has been very rewarding. The challenge, of course, in the beginning was being fresh with the story, like with understanding even what happened here in Tulsa in 1921. And then also when I came home and opened my business, I was just now coming back home. So having to reestablish relationships and really establish my business, um, creating that consistency so that people would patronize. And so that has that was a big challenge. Um, but of course, just showing up every day, learning, listening more than speaking a lot has really helped my business to be seen um, as well as to have the opportunity to contribute to the storytelling of Greenwood. Um, unfortunately, my first time really hearing about the Tulsa Race Massacre and really understanding what I was hearing was um, at the, I was in college at the Third Good Marshall Conference. It, they had a conference in New York City and I was speaking with a gentleman and he was speaking about, oh, you're from Tulsa, you're from Black Wall Street. And I was like, no, Wall Street is here in New York. And he said, no, honey, you don't know your history. You're from Tulsa, Oklahoma. There was a massacre where, you know, and he started telling me about the events and it really, it was detrimental to um, hear that information from someone who wasn't, who is not from Tulsa, um, but even more discouraging, you know, calling back to Tulsa, asking about this massacre and just the response that I was getting, you know, from my grandparents who are now passed on um, and just hearing a lot of the frustrations from the elders as it related to the massacre. But also looking back on that moment, realizing that I learned about it at the right time when I actually could really understand what my obligation or responsibility was related to the rebuilding and revitalization of the spirit of Greenwood. So even though I'm learning more and more every single day, being here on Greenwood Avenue has helped for a lot of the elders and just people to feel comfortable and approach me to share the story. So I learned so much being here, but most importantly, being able to accept the fact that I learned about it, not in Tulsa, not in Tulsa school. Um, the only thing that I read in my Oklahoma history book, because I was in AP classes at Booker T, was one sentence that spoke about um, 1905 Black Wall Street um, district on Greenwood Avenue and 1921, the destruction. That's kind of how it was phrased. It was not a long paragraph. It was literally like a sentence, maybe two, or maybe a, a run-on sentence with a semicolon. Other than that, we did not learn about the massacre. It wasn't just really spoken about in public settings. There was not a sense of accountability. Um, from the other sides of the tracks. Um, and, and that has been one thing too. It's like, you hear a lot of the African-American and Black Tulsans speak about the massacre and we're still missing another perspective of the other side. And so what, what, what is everyone's perspective is really what, what we really want to get down to it. <laughs> if I just have to put it out there, we really want to get down to acknowledging truly what happened on the, that horrible bloody day and then what has it done or not done even for the other side of the tracks as it relates to the Tulsa Massacre. That's what our true interest is. But that's when I learned about it was in college.